Thousands of Steve Irwin fans have dressed in khaki to celebrate the life of their wildlife hero. And he's quieting down now. I think he's starting to understand. I don't mean him any danger. And uh, ever since I was a boy, I've been fascinated by copperheads. Were you a fan of Steve Irwin while he was alive? And are you interested in finding out some unpopular truths about one of the most beloved television personalities of all time? Of the Normanby River to look at Australia's unique species, the freshwater crocodile. If you are, then come with us as we explore the untold truths of Steve Irwin. Childhood. Steve Irwin, beloved by many as the iconic crocodile hunter, was born on February 22, 1963, in Essendon, a suburb of Melbourne, Australia. From a young age, Steve showed a deep passion and fascination for wildlife, especially reptiles. At the size of his teeth, that means get out of my territory. This passion would shape his entire life and career as a renowned conservationist and television personality. Growing up in Australia in a wildlife-friendly family, Steve was introduced to the wonders of nature by his parents, Bob and Lynn Irwin, who were both animal lovers. His parents were both of English and Irish descent, with some Swedish on his mother's side, and they passed on their love for wildlife to their children, instilling in them a deep respect for all creatures, big and small. As a boy, Steve spent much of his time exploring the Australian countryside, often venturing into the bush to observe and interact with various animals. And uh, ever since I was a boy, I've been fascinated by copperheads. He had a natural talent for handling wildlife and fearlessly approaching even the most dangerous creatures. This fearlessness and enthusiasm for wildlife would become his trademark as he grew older and embarked on his career in conservation. One of the pivotal moments in Steve's childhood was when his family moved to the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park, now known as the Australia Zoo in 1970. This move proved to be the turning point in Steve's life as he began to work closely with the animals at the park, learning about their behaviors, habitats, and conservation needs. The young Irwin accompanied his father on expeditions in the outback to trap lizards, venomous snakes, and crocodiles, and he helped to nurse and rehabilitate the injured or abandoned kangaroos, wallabies, and birds that were brought into the park. During his time at the Australia Zoo, he developed a special bond with the resident crocodiles, a bond that would shape his future endeavors. He became known for his daring interactions with these often misunderstood reptiles, showcasing his passion for educating others about the importance of conserving wildlife and their habitats. He honed his skills and knowledge about wildlife through hands-on experiences, building a deep understanding and empathy for the creatures he encountered. See that? Squirt right on my backpack. They are really accurate, and they hit right in the eyes. Hands-on education. Steve's education, though not highly formal in the traditional academic settings, was deeply rooted in his passion for wildlife and the outdoors, starting from a young age. While he was living in Queensland, he attended Landsborough State School and Caloundra State High School. Steve did not speak much about his time in classrooms and other academic settings, but on multiple occasions, he has detailed how he learned a lot from animals by working closely with them. From his childhood days, he fostered a love for wildlife, which was inspired by his parents, Bob and Lynn Irwin, who were naturalists. Steve was immersed in a hands-on learning environment. His education began with observing and interacting with various animals, learning about their behaviors, habitats, and conservation needs. His early education laid the foundation for his future career as a wildlife educator and conservationist. He developed a keen understanding of animal behavior, biology, and environmental conservation through practical experience rather than formal education. His hands-on approach to learning allowed him to develop a deep connection with wildlife and instilled in him a passionate commitment to protecting and preserving the natural world. As he grew older, Steve continued to expand his knowledge through various experiences and encounters with wildlife. He became a proficient reptile handler and developed a particular fascination with crocodiles, which would later become his signature animal of study. His hands-on approach to learning extended beyond the boundaries of the wildlife park, as he ventured into the wild to study and document various species in their natural habitats. Despite lacking formal academic credentials in wildlife biology or zoology, Steve's practical knowledge and field experience were highly regarded by experts in the field. His hands-on approach to education and conservation resonated with a wide audience and inspired many to develop a greater appreciation for the natural world.
His success as a wildlife educator was a testament to the power of passion, dedication, and hands-on learning in shaping one's understanding of the environment. Steve's educational journey not only shaped his career, but also inspired a new generation of wildlife enthusiasts and conservationists. His legacy continues to influence the way people approach environmental education and conservation, emphasizing the importance of fostering a personal connection with nature and taking action to protect the planet. Saving Crocodiles Steve's first professional job with animals came in the early 80s when he worked with the Crocodile Management Program in Australia. We love our crocs, we love our Charlie, even though if he gets half a chance, He'd kill any one of us. The program, which was based in Queensland, was established to manage and conserve crocodile populations while minimizing conflicts between humans and these apex predators. Steve's involvement with the Crocodile Management Program began in his teenage years when he developed a keen interest in capturing and relocating crocodiles. Despite his youth, his expertise in handling reptiles and his fearless approach to wildlife made him a valuable asset to the program. As part of the Crocodile Management Program, Steve worked alongside experienced wildlife officers, learning the techniques and protocols for safely capturing and relocating crocodiles. He honed his skills in handling these formidable predators, gaining first-hand experience in dealing with their behavior and biology. He's carrying a lot of scar tissue. He's carrying a lot of pain from his tormented life. The primary objective of the Crocodile Management Program was to mitigate conflicts between crocodiles and humans. As human populations expanded into crocodile habitats, encounters between people and crocodiles became more frequent, posing risks to both human safety and crocodile conservation. Of the Normanby River to look at Australia's unique species, the freshwater crocodile. This meant that the role of Steve and some others within the program was to respond to reports of crocodile sightings or encounters with humans. He would often be called upon to capture and relocate crocodiles that posed a threat to public safety or were deemed to be dangerous to human activities. Not long after joining the program, Steve started going off on these crocodile-saving expeditions by himself. Sometimes he would spend months alone in the bush in search of these large reptiles. He was so skilled at capturing the largest and most dangerous crocodiles that he eventually acquired a reputation as Australia's top croc catcher. Steve often recorded some of his exploits on tape using a video camera mounted on a tripod, and when he was hired as a consultant for a television commercial, he showed some of the tapes to a producer at Australia's Channel 10 network, who immediately suggested turning them into a documentary. The result was a 10-hour program, The Crocodile Hunter, which first aired in Australia in 1992. The Crocodile Hunter. You're a good girl, I'm getting out. I see you, I see you. The story of Steve's popular television show is not complete without mentioning his wife, Terry. Steve had just started managing his father's park in October 1991, and a few days after this change, he met Terry Raines. She was a visiting American tourist and also a naturalist like Steve. According to Terry, it was love at first sight the moment she met him, and the pair got married nine months later. Instead of a honeymoon, the couple embarked on filming a wildlife documentary while relocating a problem crocodile in far north Queensland. This was part of Steve's crocodile management program, and their videos were so interesting that it was turned into the Crocodile Hunter series in 1992. This show aired mainly in Australia, before it was picked up by Animal Planet. At the peak of its popularity, the show aired in more than 200 countries. One of the defining features of The Crocodile Hunter was Steve's hands-on approach to interacting with wildlife. Whether he was capturing crocodiles, wrestling snakes, or handling other dangerous animals, Steve's daring encounters kept viewers on the edge of their seats. His close interactions with wildlife provided a rare and insightful look into the behavior and ecology of various species, captivating audiences, and fostering a deeper appreciation for the natural world. Steve's show was not only about thrilling encounters with dangerous animals, but also about education and conservation. Each episode of The Crocodile Hunter was filled with valuable information about the animals featured, their habitats, and the importance of conservation efforts to protect them. Steve's passion for wildlife conservation was evident throughout the show as he emphasized the need to preserve biodiversity and protect endangered species from extinction. The Crocodile Hunter also played a significant role in raising awareness about the importance of wildlife conservation. He'll be happy now, more so. I tell you what, she's cruising now too. Like, as soon as she bumped into him, she's like, ah, my man. And environmental stewardship. 
Steve used his platform to educate viewers about the threats facing wildlife, such as habitat loss, poaching, and climate change, and encouraged them to take action to protect the natural world. His infectious enthusiasm and dedication to conservation inspired countless viewers to get involved in wildlife conservation efforts and make a positive impact in their communities. Scared of Parrots While audiences had seen Steve fearlessly get up close with crocodiles and venomous snakes, Poachers are the bane of my existence. Once we get this crocodile safe and sound, I'm gonna come back here. There were still animals that he feared, and did not like going close to. This is one of the untold truths of Steve Irwin. He was surprisingly wary of parrots. Although known for their colorful plumage and playful personalities, parrots possess sharp beaks, loud voices, and unpredictable behaviors that could make them challenging for even the most experienced animal handler like Steve. Parrots are also known for their intelligence, social nature, and vocal abilities, making them popular pets and fascinating subjects for study in the field of animal behavior. And Steve had a deep appreciation for parrots and their unique characteristics. However, there were instances where he mentioned feeling a sense of caution around parrots, particularly larger species known for their strong beaks and potentially aggressive behaviors. He has said in an interview that almost every time he is around parrots, he gets bitten. No matter how hard he tried to respect the colorful bird, he also recounted a almost deadly incident with parrots as a child. He explained that when he was four years old, he almost had his nose bitten off by his father's pet parrot. Since then, the only bird he felt comfortable around was a black cockatoo named Uluru. Parrots have sharp, curved beaks that are adapted for cracking nuts and seeds, but they can also deliver painful bites when they feel threatened or stressed. Steve, who was accustomed to handling a wide variety of animals, is now aware of the potential risks involved in interacting with parrots, especially those that were not accustomed to human contact or experienced high levels of stress. Despite his respect for parrots and his expertise, Steve was not immune to the occasional mishap when handling them. In one memorable incident, captured on camera, Steve was bitten by a parrot while attempting to handle it during a public demonstration. Though the bite was minor, it served as a reminder of the unpredictability of working with wild animals, even those as seemingly benign as parrots. Regardless of his fears, he had a deep appreciation for parrots and their role in the ecosystem. He often highlighted their intelligence and adaptability, showcasing their ability to problem-solve and communicate with each other, using a diverse range of vocalizations and behaviors. In his television programs and documentaries, Steve occasionally featured encounters with parrots, providing viewers with insights into their behavior and biology. While he approached these encounters with caution, he also demonstrated a genuine respect for these remarkable birds and sought to foster greater understanding and appreciation for them among his audience. No need for anti-venom. Crocodiles were not the only dangerous reptiles that Steve was concerned about. He also had a dangerous and fun relationship with snakes of all kinds, venomous and non-venomous. And you would think that Irwin would have anti-venom close by, for instance when the snakes forget that they in the presence of an animal lover. Surprisingly, he never carried anti-venom with him. And he's quieting down now. I think he's starting to understand. I don't mean him any danger. He manhandled numerous snakes throughout his career and never for once had the contingency plan of anti-venom to help him out in case of an emergency. He has explained why he does not carry anti-venom with him, and one of the primary reasons is that he believes that when he touches the snake, he transmits good karma into the snake, and it feels comfortable around him. This is not a very good reason not to carry anti-venom if you ask us, but what do we know? We are not snake experts. Another reason Steve did not walk around with anti-venom was because he trusted in his knowledge and experience with wildlife. With years of hands-on experience dealing with a wide range of creatures, from venomous snakes to massive crocodiles, he had developed a keen understanding of animal behavior, body language, and potential risks. His exceptional field expertise and deep respect for animals allowed him to gauge situations carefully and respond swiftly and appropriately to any potential threats. Another aspect to consider is the logistical challenge associated with carrying anti-venom in the remote and often rugged environments where Irwin conducted his wildlife expeditions. Many of the locations Steve ventured into, such as dense rainforests, arid deserts, and vast savannas, were far from medical facilities or resources. Carrying anti-venom would require careful storage, proper handling, and expert administration in the event of an emergency, posing practical challenges in the context of Irwin's dynamic and unpredictable encounters with wildlife. This place is crawling with snakes.
Lastly, Steve's decision not to carry anti-venom was shaped by his desire to present an authentic and unfiltered representation of wildlife to his audience. By choosing to forego safety nets like anti-venom, he embraced the inherent risks and uncertainties of working with wild animals, demonstrating the raw and unscripted nature of his interactions. This authenticity resonated with viewers around the world, who were captivated by Steve's fearless spirit, genuine passion for wildlife, and infectious enthusiasm. It is important to note that Steve's choice not to carry anti-venom was not a reckless disregard for his safety or well-being. He was acutely aware of the potential dangers associated with his work and took precautions to mitigate risks where possible. His approach was grounded in careful observation, respect for wildlife, and a deep appreciation for the beauty and complexity of the natural world. Running around with a broken finger and collarbone, Another untold truth about Steve was the fact that he struggled with a lot of injuries. When we talk about the dangers of the nature of his job, we go straight to the risk of him getting bitten by venomous animals. In doing so, we ignore how difficult it is for him to wrestle with some of these large reptiles in a bid to capture them or move them from a dangerous location to a much safer one. The rigors involved in that part of the job led to Steve having multiple major and minor injuries most of the time. Regardless of these injuries, he always showed immense perseverance to keep working, no matter how much pain he was in. One notable instance of his perseverance in the face of injury occurred during an encounter with a saltwater crocodile. While filming a documentary in Northern Australia, he sustained a broken finger when the massive reptile snapped its jaws shut on his hand during a feeding demonstration. Despite the intense pain and discomfort, he remained composed and focused on ensuring the safety of the crocodile and his team. His quick thinking and decisive actions in that harrowing moment underscored his commitment to wildlife and his ability to remain calm under pressure. Following the capture operation, Steve sought medical attention for his injured finger, which was later confirmed to be broken. Despite the pain and discomfort, he remained undeterred, refusing to let his injury sideline him from his work. He's really grumpy, and I tell you what, he'd be able to bite my nose clean off. They've got a really powerful... Instead, he continued filming and conducting research, determined to fulfill his obligations to his audience and to the animals he dedicated his life to protecting. In addition to his broken finger, Steve Irwin also faced challenges related to a broken collarbone, another injury sustained during his adventurous exploits in the wild. While the exact circumstances surrounding the injury are less well documented than those of his broken finger, it is clear that Steve's broken collarbone did not prevent him from continuing his work as the crocodile hunter. Throughout his career, Steve encountered numerous injuries and close calls, but he never allowed them to diminish his passion for wildlife conservation or his dedication to his work. His resilience in the face of adversity served as an inspiration to millions of people around the world, demonstrating the importance of perseverance and determination in the pursuit of one's goals. Nature-loving family. Steve has always been blessed with family members who are as passionate about wildlife as he is. As we stated earlier, his parents were nature lovers who did their best to save exotic wildlife in Australia. As we mentioned earlier, Steve Irwin's parents were passionate about preserving Australia's exotic wildlife. Later in life, Irwin married Terry, who shared his passion for nature. Terry, originally from Eugene, Oregon, first met Steve in 1991 when she visited the Australia Zoo while on vacation. We've got machinery, there's men, and there's not a thing we can do. Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Their connection was immediate, fueled by their mutual love for wildlife and the environment. Terry was drawn to Steve's enthusiasm and infectious energy, and soon after, they were married in 1992. From the outset, Terry fully embraced his adventurous lifestyle and his commitment to wildlife conservation. Together, they expanded the Australia Zoo, which was founded by Steve's parents, into a world-renowned wildlife conservation facility. Terry played an integral role in the day-to-day -day operations of the zoo, managing various aspects of the organization alongside her husband. In addition to their work at the Australia Zoo, Terry and Steve co-hosted the popular wildlife documentary series, The Crocodile Hunter. The show showcased their fearless encounters with dangerous animals. Tooth structure, huge, great, penetrating teeth. Whoa, just like my fingers, designed to... And their efforts to educate the public about the importance of conservation. Terry's unwavering support and participation in his adventures solidified their status as a dynamic duo in the world of wildlife television. In 1998, the Irwin family welcomed their first child, 
a daughter named Bindi Sue Irwin. Bindi inherited her parents' passion for wildlife from an early age and quickly became a familiar face alongside her parents on television. She appeared on numerous episodes of The Crocodile Hunter and later starred in her wildlife series, Bindi the Jungle Girl. As Bindi grew older, she continued to honor her father's legacy through her work as a conservationist and wildlife advocate. She became involved in various environmental projects and was appointed as a global ambassador for wildlife conservation organizations. In 2015, Bindi won the 21st season of Dancing with the Stars, further raising her profile and spreading awareness about conservation issues. In 2003, the Irwin family expanded once again with the birth of their son, Robert Clarence Irwin. Like his sister, Robert developed a deep love for wildlife at a young age and eagerly followed in his father's footsteps. He made his television debut at the age of two on The Crocodile Hunter Diaries and later co-hosted the wildlife series Wild But True. Robert's passion for wildlife extended beyond television appearances as he actively participated in conservation initiatives and wildlife rescue efforts. He inherited his father's fearlessness and enthusiasm for working with animals, often showcasing his knowledge and expertise in various wildlife documentaries and television programs. The Irwin family has done a lot to preserve the wildlife and environment as a whole, and the world would continually be grateful for their efforts. Steve Irwin and his parents' park. Irwin's involvement in the management and development of Australia Zoo, founded by his parents Bob and Lynn Irwin, shaped the institution's evolution into a renowned wildlife conservation facility that continues to carry forward his legacy of environmental stewardship and animal advocacy. Australia Zoo, originally established as Beerwa Reptile and Fauna Park in Queensland, Australia, Bizarre is out of the dozens or actual fact hundreds of snakes we've seen on this beautiful underwent a transformative journey under the guidance and influence of the Irwin family. Steve's deep-rooted connection to the zoo, nurtured from a young age by his parents' love for animals and their commitment to wildlife conservation, inspired his lifelong mission to educate the public about the wonders of wildlife and the importance of protecting biodiversity. From its humble beginnings as a small reptile park to its evolution into one of the world's most renowned wildlife conservation facilities, the Australia Zoo owes much of its success to Irwin's vision, enthusiasm, and tireless efforts. In 1991, Steve took over as the park's director. Since then, he expanded the zoo's collection of exotic animals, including crocodiles, snakes, mammals, and birds, to provide visitors with immersive and educational experiences that promoted a deeper understanding and appreciation for wildlife. He then went on to focus on crocodile conservation and research. Building on his expertise in handling and studying crocodiles, Irwin spearheaded efforts to raise awareness about the importance of protecting these apex predators and their critical role in aquatic ecosystems. Through interactive crocodile shows, educational programs, and conservation projects, he sought to dispel myths about crocodiles and highlight the need for their conservation in the face of habitat loss and human-wildlife conflicts. In addition to his work with crocodiles, Steve was instrumental in establishing the Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital, a state-of-the-art medical facility dedicated to caring for injured, sick, and orphaned wildlife. The hospital, founded in 2004, reflected his commitment to animal welfare and his belief in providing high-quality veterinary care to native species in need. A hot spot for all species of wildlife, particularly crocodiles. It's like a halfway zone from the ocean. The hospital's mission aligns with his vision of creating a haven for wildlife and a hub for wildlife rehabilitation, research, and education. Beyond his role as a wildlife advocate and television personality, Steve's involvement in Australia Zoo's daily operations set him apart as a dedicated and approachable figure in the conservation community. He was known to interact with visitors, participate in animal feeding sessions, and share his knowledge and passion for wildlife with audiences of all ages. His genuine enthusiasm, infectious energy, and genuine love for animals created a welcoming and engaging atmosphere at the zoo, fostering memorable experiences for guests and fostering a sense of connection to the natural world. His impact on Australia Zoo extended beyond his lifetime, as his legacy continues to inspire ongoing conservation efforts, educational programs, and community outreach initiatives at the facility. His family, including his wife Terry, and their children Bindi and Robert, have taken up the mantle of leadership at Australia Zoo, 
carrying forward Irwin's vision and passion for wildlife conservation with dedication and purpose. The Tragic Passing of Steve Irwin Sadly, on September 4, 2006, Steve died while filming an ocean documentary at the age of 44. The circumstances surrounding his death were as shocking as they were tragic. While filming a segment for the documentary Ocean's Deadliest on the Great Barrier Reef, Steve encountered a large stingray in shallow waters. And down a bit, the dirt is quite moist, and you can see as the leaf litter breaks down. As he approached the animal to capture footage for the documentary, the stingray suddenly lashed out, striking Steve in the chest with its barb. Despite the best efforts of his crew and emergency responders, Irwin succumbed to his injuries and passed away shortly thereafter. The incident was captured on film, and while it was never broadcasted, it left viewers shocked, and there was an outpouring of grief and disbelief from fans who had come to know and love Steve for his daring wildlife encounters, infectious enthusiasm, and genuine love for animals. Tributes poured in from all corners of the globe, with world leaders, celebrities, and ordinary people alike expressing their condolences and paying tribute to Irwin's remarkable life and legacy. And in Australia, where he was a national icon, the news of his death was met with an overwhelming sense of sadness and loss. Prime Minister John Howard described him as a wonderful Australian ambassador and praised his passion for wildlife conservation. Across the country, flags flew at half-mast, and memorial services were held to honor Irwin's memory and celebrate his contributions to conservation. Steve's death served as a reminder of the inherent risks and dangers associated with working closely with wild animals, even for someone as experienced and knowledgeable as he was. Despite his years of expertise in handling dangerous reptiles, crocodiles, and other wildlife, his encounter with the stingray highlighted the unpredictable and dangerous nature of the animal kingdom where even the most seasoned experts are not immune to accidents or unforeseen circumstances. Regardless, Steve would be remembered positively for his efforts to educate the public on the dangers faced by wildlife and also his efforts to keep these animals safe. We can only hope that there will be more people like him to help us save our planet and the species within it. Thank you for watching this video. We will see you in the next one.